Great. Looks like it's working. Okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about articular cartilage injuries of the knee and treatment. So not all injuries are symptomatic. And um, of those that are, there is a large range in symptoms. So sometimes you can have swelling, um, varying amounts of pain, and also at times catching. Um, some of these lesions, especially if they're smaller, can be treated non-operatively. And uh, so if you treat somebody non-operatively, you can have them activity modify, um, also try a brace such as an unloader brace, and you can also consider injections such as cortisone, visco, uh, PRP, and stem cells. And we'll touch on stem cells a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so there are different categories of uh, treatment for articular cartilage injuries. Um, there are palliative treatments, which would say be debridement such as chondroplasty, uh, reparative such as meristimulation or microfracture, and then you also have uh, restorative such as osteochondral um, plugs, um, cartilage transplantation such as Macy. And then with all of these procedures, you always want to um, consider, re consider realignment such as osteotomies. Okay, so, um, so one of the treatments could be um, chondroplasty. And one take home point, uh, and I have a case on this later, but is just to never underestimate uh, the power of chondroplasty. Um, I've actually had some really good results with chondroplasty uh, in, in my practice, to, depending on the lesion. Um, some of the studies show say 52 to 74% good results uh, can help with pain and also mechanical symptoms such as catching or locking and grinding. Um, and you can also remove loose bodies at the same time. And the nice thing with chondroplasty um, is it's just a really easy recovery and you're not burning any bridges for, for future. And the other thing you can do um, is if you're doing a chondroplasty at the same time, you can also take a biopsy for, for Macy, um, the just in case for future use. So if they don't do well enough with the chondroplasty, then you can always do Macy later. Okay, so for microfracture, um, this creates rough surfaces for blood clot attachment and then access to the mesenchymal stem cells and growth factors. And when you do a microfracture, you wanna poke the holes about three to four millimeters apart and make sure you get about two to three millimeters deep. So here's just an example of say a lesion that's um, amenable to microfracture. Of course, you clean up this unhealthy cartilage first and the edges, um, but as long as the surrounding cartilage is healthy and the lesion is fairly small, um, I'd say usually about a centimeter or less or 1.5 centimeters or less then often uh, the microfracture can work pretty well. Um, then at the end, usually you turn the, the inflow off and then you can see the, the blood from the microfracture site. Um, so just um, for a study on, on say microfracture results, these are some of the original studies from Stedman. So 11 year results, 80% of patients reported that they had improved. Um, here's a um, older microfracture result study for say NFL players. There was a 76% return to play after a year. And in the NBA, um, not, not quite as good here. So 38% um, never, never returned to play. And that was from um, AJSM in 2009. I wonder, is there a way for me to just hide this thing? <laughs> We, we actually don't see it. Um, oh, you don't? Okay. Is, um, but you can drag it elsewhere on your screen. Just, okay. Yeah, I kind of dragged it to the bottom. It should be okay. Um, all right. So so other, other studies with microfracture outcomes, um, sort of the summary is that the 24-month follow-up is usually pretty good, but then the long-term result is not as good. Um, and so the thought process with that is that with the microfracture, you're forming more fiber cartilage instead of hyaline cartilage, and it just doesn't hold up as well throughout, throughout the years. Um, and some other problems with microfracture besides, say, um, the formation more of fiber cartilage instead of hyaline is that some studies show shrinkage and detachment of the platelet-driven clot, and that can be as high as 50%. Um, and so again, there is this functional decline in some study patients at usually around, around two years. 
Okay, so one of the restorative treatments is mosaic plasty, also called oats. And you can also do bulk allografts for say, uh, larger lesions, uncontained lesions, um, and lesions that have a lot of uh, subchondral bone involved. Um, a restorative treatment would be um, ACI or MACI. Uh, MACI is just the newer, the newer ACI, which we'll talk about. Okay, so what are some advantages to osteochondral plugs or say an um, autographed OATS procedure? Well, it's an intact quote organ. Um, so it duplicates the complex multilayer structure of cartilage and bone better than other procedures. So we think it might um, duplicate native biomechanics. It's pre-cellularized. And um, we also think that, that this has perhaps a more rapid healing um, in terms of the cartilage because of the bony incorporation that the bone can heal uh, better and faster than the cartilage and has a better blood supply. And another advantage is that you can replace unhealthy bone as well as cartilage with this procedure. So for example, with o OCD bone, and you can potentially weight bear these patients earlier. So um, this has come up in our surgical sports group quite a bit. And some of us actually allow at least partial weight bearing after about two weeks. Um, so other advantages is just one operation instead of say Macy, which is for sure two. Um, you have readily available tissue. It's less expensive than Macy and um, say um, um, allograft plugs. But uh, one limitation is the, the defect size. So this comes up in our Monday conferences, you know, what is the largest size where you would consider solely autographed oats? And really the answer is usually about two centimeters because if the cartilage defect area is larger than that, there just are not enough donor sites to harvest from. Um, and then you uh, always wanna think about complications. So one issue could be graft height. If you don't get the graft height quite right, if it's too prominent, that could be a problem. If it's too inset, that could be a problem, right? Because then it's not gonna um, weight bear very well. And then contour. And this is definitely a problem in the patellofemoral joint, um, which is why oats is not as common in the pat uh, patellofemoral joint because you're trying to match a, a condyle or a lateral trochlea uh, contour to say the patella. Okay, so here's an example of say mosaic plasty results. So 10 to 14 years after mosaic plasty, uh, poorer outcomes if you're 40 years or older or a really large area. So three centimeters or more is probably too large, um, but um, less than 12.5% failure rate if the patient's younger than 40 and with a small lesion. So bulk osteochondral allograft, I would say this is getting more and more common. Um, so these undergo bacterial and PCR testing, but they can sometimes be difficult to obtain, but again, easier, um, easier recently. And you need to size match these, but not tissue type match. So this would be used for say larger lesions. Um, there are potential complications with this. Uh, sometimes the graft does not incorporate as well, both the cartilage and the bone because it's allograft. Um, the, subchondral bone could collapse. The quality is probably not going to be good, as good as autograft. And um, there is some question in terms of how long these really are going to survive. So this is a, um, a, a more recent study. This is from JBJS in 2018. Um, and they looked at these fresh osteochondral allografts for um, after failed cartilage repair surgery. Okay, so say after, for example, microfracture. Um, it was a retrospective review, mean follow-up 3.5 years, and the overall graft survival was over 90%, so pretty good. Um, the patients had significant improvement in pain and functional scores, but 40% uh, underwent reoperation, usually just a scope for, um, for say, scar tissue or uh, a, a manipulation under anesthesia for stiffness, and patients with a lower BMI had better clinical outcomes. So, you know, this is from, um, an, or I was just going to say, an, at Rush, where, say, Drew and Stephanie did their fellowships, they, they were doing um, quite a few of the osteochondral allografts, and Rush has done some of the initial um, studies on them as well. Okay, so, so overall, osteochondral allograft is a good operation, um, but you can just expect to have MRI signal changes for at least up to a, a year. You definitely want to be aware of malalignment with, with these patients and correct it if, if you need to. 
Um, and then you adjust the depth of the plug depending on the depth of the lesion. And you always wanna try to be perpendicular to the articular surface. Okay, so um, now we're gonna move on to, to ACI, which now we usually call Macy. Um, and a little bit about the history. So in 1965, that, that's the year that, um, that cells were first uh, cultured from articular cartilage. And 1987 was the year that the first human ACI was performed and it became officially FDA approved in 1997. Okay, so um, in order to, to do the ACI or MACI, you have to take biopsies of cartilage from the patient's own tissue. So usually we take two, and usually these are about five by eight millimeters. And I know the reps would usually tell us, oh, you want each piece to be the size of a tic-tac. Okay, and when in doubt, take a little more because it's not, not good if say you don't have enough and the patients had the first stage of a two-stage surgery and they can't have the second stage because you didn't take enough. Um, then the... Um, then the cartilage is grown and then sent back to you. And um, you do these through open or, or mini open surgeries. You debride the old area um, or, or the, the diseased area of bone with, um, with the missing cartilage. And then when, so I first started my practice in 2007. So prior to 2007, we were actually using um, periosteum <laughs> for this. So we would harvest periosteum from say the, the anterior medial tibia. And then, um, and then we would use that periosteum as the patch and then inject the cells underneath that. Then um, the second generation um, ACI, we started to use these uh, porcine collagen patches. Okay, so instead of, peri of autograph periosteum, we were using these patches. And then we would suture the patch, seal them, and inject and inject the cells. So it was actually um, kind of a labor-intensive, long process, and you really had to make sure that there was no leakage of the cells. So you had to seal the outside really well, and um, so many many times with very small suture. Um, and then we'll talk about the third generation modern technique in a minute. Um, so. ACI consideration. So who's really a good candidate for, for ACI or Macy in general? Well, you want to make sure that, that it's really, um, say, one isolated chondral defect in that area. I mean, it's okay to, to Macy multiple lesions throughout the knee, but if you have kissing lesions, they're, they're not going to do as well. And actually, sometimes then they won't be approved by the insurance either. Um, usually, you want the lesion to be greater than two centimeters, because if it's not, then the insurance company is going to say, well, why don't you just do an oats or, or a microfracture? Um, you want the patient usually to be less than 50 and their BMI to be less than 35. Um, there are some complications uh, such as graft hypertrophy. Um, about 10 to 30% of cases have this. And of course, uh, the potential for poor cartilage fill that the cartilage just doesn't fill well, even if you think it's going to form highland cartilage. Um, so here's an example of a study showing some ACI results. Um, this was, um, of course, a ACI, not Macy. This is from 2010. And over 10 years, 69% experienced continued improvement beyond five years, and 17% failed. 72% of the, those failures occurred in the first two years. So I found this in my practice too, that if for the patients who, for whatever reason, just are not going to do well with ACI, you usually know pretty early on. And I and I believe it's, it's really just because they didn't get a good cartilage fill. Here's another um, example of ACI results, five-year um, outcomes following ACI, 83% fill and 82% integration, 9.5% failure, 47% uh, with persistent bony edema. So you can just expect this whether or not it's, it's really symptomatic. And 90% uh, of patients maintained improvement in clinical outcomes. And then comparing these different cartilage techniques, okay, say microfracture, ACI, and OATS. There are so many studies. <laughs> and really, you can find studies to justify whatever, whatever you want to do, but there are some trends, <laughs> which I'll, I'll summarize at the end here. Um, so this is a study comparing uh, first-generation ACI versus microfracture. Um, this study was published a couple of times in JBJS, and the reason was they kept 
um, studying outcomes, say every five years or every 10 years. So this was a randomized controlled trial, uh, microfracture versus ACI for large lesions. I mean, these are, these are really large, um, but again, this is before say osteochondral allograft was, was really popularized. Um, so they showed no significant difference in functional outcome scores at a minimum follow-up of 14 years. Um, and failure rates were 42% in the ACI group and 32% in the microfracture group. Okay, this study looked at um, ACI versus mosaic plasty, minimum follow-up of 10 years, 17% um, versus 55% failure for ACI versus mosaic plasty. And um, then there were quite a few studies looking at mosaic plasty versus microfracture. Um, this study was retrospective and showed similar subjective outcome scores and that mosaic plasty group had greater improvement in activity rating scales from baseline to five years. Here's another one, mosaic plasty versus microfracture. Um, this was a meta-analysis looking um, at studies for isolated cartilage lesions and found that mosaic plasty patients achieved higher activity scores and lower risk of failure for lesions uh, greater than three centimeters, okay? So again, take home point here, you just don't want to microfracture a large lesion that's say um, greater than three centimeters. And uh, the microfracture performed more poorly with um, OCD compromised bone. So, you know, with microfracture, you're relying on bone blood supply. So if you have um, poor quality bone in the area where you're gonna microfracture just probably is not a good idea. Okay, and then one more study, a mosaic plasty versus microfracture from arthroscopy journal, um, prospective randomized trial, oats versus microfracture, 93% of oats patients were able to return to pre-injury level of sports um, compared to 52% who underwent, un underwent microfracture. So again, we just think that the, especially in say a high impact type athlete, that the oats cartilage will probably hold up better over time than the microfracture cartilage. Um, so one joint to really seriously consider Macy just overall bird's eye view is the patellofemoral joint, okay? Um, so some studies show ACI has about 80% good to excellent results in the patellofemoral joint. Some of these patients do have a concurrent tibial tubercle osteotomy and or lateral release. Um, this study showed uh, 85 or 85 percent of patients reported good to excellent results with isolated patellofemoral lesions at five years, and same with this other um, Hamby study. So, like I touched on before, part of the reason why we really would consider Macy and the patellofemoral joint is it's just not a very good, uh, or it's not a joint that's very amenable to say an oats. Um, and it's really two reasons: one is contouring issues, but another uh, issue, say with the patella is that it's not very deep. So it's sometimes hard to put an oats plug into the patella and secure it well, because you don't have enough bony depth. Okay, so then what are some negatives to ACI or Macy? Um, so I put a question mark by this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this, but uh, potentially um, if the patients had a prior marrow stimulation technique, such as microfracture, um, some studies show an up to three times higher ACI failure rate, okay, if you ACI into a defect that was previously microfractured. Um, but I've put a question mark by that. And another negative is that um, there's not really an advantage for smaller lesions. So it's a two-stage surgery. It's costly and, you know, maybe not very applicable to smaller lesions. It is better for larger lesions, say greater than two centimeters. It's still very expensive and it's a two-stage surgery. Okay, and then this is why I put the, the question mark there. So this is a, a newer study, this is out of Rush, and we did a, a journal club with our sports group with Dr. Cole, and I looked up through my email, it was April, 2020. Um, and so, um, so this study was looking at ACI um, and osteochondral allograft in the setting of a failed marrow stimulation uh, prior surgery, such as microfracture. So they looked at 359 patients and their conclusion was that ACI and osteochondral allograft are both viable treatment options for these chondral defects in the knee, even in the setting of a failed, say, prior microfracture. Um, and so again, that, that gets to this question mark here. Well, why do so many other studies, especially um, studies, say, by Minus, 
show that um, that you maybe don't want to do MACI or ACI after a failed microfracture? Well, I, I read through before I gave this talk the discussion section in this Dr. Cole article, um, and there there were some differences in the patients between this. Brian Cole article and say the, the minus article. So in this Rush article, um, the patients were um, younger and they had on average a lower BMI and they also had fewer, uh, fewer workers comp patients. <laughs> so the, the conclusion from our journal club was if you select these patients um, in a certain way, even if they've had a prior failed microfracture, that it is still probably okay to do in ACI, and you don't necessarily have to go straight to osteochondral allograft. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about this third generation Macy. Okay, this came out in 2019, um, and it's third, and it's called third generation because now the cells are given to you back on a patch scaffold. Okay, so it's way easier. You don't have to be injecting syringes and sewing water tight patches and sealing everything that way. Um, so <clears throat> the cells come to you on a patch scaffold. It's tear resistant. You can trim it to fit your defect. You no longer have to harvest um, periosteum and it is a type one and three collagen patch. Okay, and so as I said, this is then easier technically and another potential advantage to this third generation instead of the say liquid, um, liquid membrane sewing technique is that we actually think that now there's less graft hypertrophy. So some of the earlier studies are now showing maybe 5% graft hypertrophy instead of 25%. So that's another potential advantage of the third generation Macy. Now there is still um, an application where, where a lot of surgeons would still use the um, say second generation Macy instead of the third. And so you'd still consider doing the liquid and all the sealing of, of the patches. Um, and that, that would be this sandwich technique. Um, so I think now a lot of us would do osteochondral allografts, but if you still wanted to do, to do Macy, you could. But then if you have um, say a defect involving eight millimeters of bone thickness um, in terms of the depth, and, and a defect size in terms of, of width or diameter of greater than three centimeters, then you can um, still do this sandwich technique. Uh, so with the sandwich technique, I mean, the, I, I was actually thinking of not including it in the talk that maybe people just aren't doing it anymore <laughs> because we're doing a lot more of the osteochondral allografts for these patients, but this, um, this arthroscopy technique article was published in 2019. So I think there are still people that are doing it. Um, but you do have to do this within arthrotomy. You basically prep the bone base and you, um, you drill into the bone base, prep it with a K-wire, and then you can bone graft this bone defect. So say you have an, uh, a one centimeter deep bone defect, you can bone graft, and then you put on one membrane and attach it. And then you, um, then you put on the second membrane, and then you inject the cells between the two ACI membranes. Okay, and then again, just a reminder to always consider limb alignment with these cartilage procedures. Um, and you always want to consider it, of course, in the medial or lateral compartments, but also in the patellofemoral joint. So say in conjunction with a Fulkerson osteotomy. Okay, so here's sort of a, a summary slide of what we've talked about. So if you have a small cartilage injury or a flap, say a patient just with some locking and catching, then you can consider uh, chondroplasty, also consider microfracture. Um, if you have um, still a smaller lesion, but with subchondral bone changes, I would definitely consider oats. And larger lesions, so say greater than two centimeters, um, that's when usually we, we want to uh, consider Macy and then possibly um, oats, but you might need to supplement with say some cadaver plugs or an osteochondral allograft if the, if the lesion's really large. In the patellofemoral joint, um, oats is often difficult. So you wanna consider Macy. And then again, just keep in mind the patient's alignment. Um, and then 
especially say at, at, at UCSF or depending on where you practice when you're done, if you have access to MRI with T1 row, um, I would also consider T1 row MRI in patients with a prior cartilage restoration procedure if they're not doing well. Um, so, so for example, um, you can see cartilage fill in microfracture patients who are not doing well on a standard MRI, but, um, but T1 row just allows you to characterize the quality of this cartilage better. Um, and then of course, see if they maybe still have some persistent bone edema in the area. Okay, um, so how about Laura? So this was actually a, a question that came up in one of our Monday conferences recently. So, so say you have a, um, a patient who, um, who say tw twisted her knee about, uh, about three months ago and initially she had some symptoms in her lateral joint line, she has a very isolated lateral femoral condyle cartilage defect with um, no bone edema and all of her other cartilage looks healthy. She's not having mechanical symptoms. So she probably does have a little floater, but it's not bothering her. Um, and you got an MRI and an X-ray. And, but now all of a sudden she comes back to your clinic two months later and she's symptom free. Okay, she has no more lateral pain, no mechanical symptoms, no swelling. So of course she's now leaning towards not having surgery. Um, so um, of, these, of these measurements, so say a two millimeter lateral femoral condyle um, full thickness cartilage defect versus five versus 10, which, which ones would you tell her, okay, don't, don't worry about it. You know, if you're symptom free now, uh, we probably don't need to do surgery. We probably don't need to get any follow-up imaging. Uh, I don't actually know the data on this, but I would think at 10, I would definitely be concerned about, and two, I probably wouldn't. So um, five is somewhere in between, and I'm not totally sure where I'd put them. Yep, and that that is that was the consensus at our at our conference. So. Um, so if you, and I've actually had a couple of patients like this recently where initially they say have a, a low energy cartilage injury and they're very symptomatic. And then all of a sudden their, their symptoms really calm down. Um, so, so yeah, if the lesion is um, five by five millimeters or smaller, then we do think that it's safe to probably just leave that lesion for the rest of their life that they have enough remaining healthy cartilage in that compartment um, that, it's, that it's safe to, to leave that. Okay, so a little bit um, about this juvenile cartilage. We don't use this very much at UCSF, but you'll definitely um, hear about it. So it's called de novo. It's juvenile particulated cartilage. It's been available since 2007. Um, its hype is that it has maybe a 10 times greater chondrocyte density than adult tissue. But um, just so you know, at least those of us with UCSF um, doing a little bit more evidence-based practice, we still think that um, there are not enough long-term outcome studies and that it's, um, so it's still somewhat experimental and it, it just hasn't really demonstrated a lot of sup superiority over other cartilage procedures. Um, but this study did have 25 patients with two-year follow-up, uh, pain scores significantly improved, 20% had graft hypertrophy on, an MRI, on the MRI, and 10% had graft delamination. So just something you'll hear about, but you probably won't see done a lot with, with our group yet. Um, <clears throat> this is a um, promising novel cartilage treatment, but again, just there aren't that many um, studies on it yet. So, um, but, but this has future potential advantages. So it's an HA-based scaffold um, with embedded bone marrow aspirate concentrate secured with fibrin glue. And an advantage is unlike Macy that this would be a one-step procedure and it's also less expensive than Macy, but um, I just don't think a lot of us are, are doing this yet just because of lack of data, but hopefully in the future, this might be a, a really good procedure. Okay. And just a few words on stem cells. I mean, you'll see you get so many questions about these from patients now. Um, so what I, this is somewhat how I counsel patients on it, that it's just still not FDA approved, not regulated. There are no registries. Um, that if you look at the literature, it's really comparing apples to oranges. So there's juvenile, amniotic, 
adipose, bone marrow, you know, auto, allo. Um, so it's just hard to hard to tell what's really going on in the literature. Um, and there are a couple of sort of scary um, studies that came out with stem cells in the last few years. So this is a, a study that came out in the New York Times in December 2018. And there were 12 patients who were hospitalized due to infections from injected amniotic cord blood stem cells from Genentech. So, you know, a reputable company, just scary. And these patients had anywhere from four to 58 days of hospitalization from their infections. And other unused valves tested positive for E. coli and other fecal bacteria. And then I thought this was an interesting, disturbing article that I read recently, JBJS January 2020, um, about direct online to consumer advertising of these stem cell, stem cell clinics and looking at how much misinformation is out there. So the authors looked at 896 practice websites and about 96% contained at least one statement of misinformation with a mean of <laughs> almost five statements of misinformation among the sites. And you think, oh, well, what if this clinic is associated with an orthopedic surgeon or a podiatrist, is it better? Well, um, those only provided 22% fewer statements of misinformation. <laughs> so definitely scary. And I just tell patients that, you know, a, a lot of the websites do um, kind of focus more on, on testimonials or rely more on testimonials. And I'm hoping in the future that we can offer them with confidence, but I just feel like the data and the safety aren't, aren't there yet. Okay, so um, I did have like some sample questions, say from you know ortho bullets or board reviews. So let's see, how about um, how about Aaron? Let's let's do this one. So this is the imaging, and I'm happy to go back and forth. Okay, so these are the um, I guess the radiographs and MR of a 10 year old boy who has had four weeks of lateral knee pain, which began while he was playing soccer. The pain is only present with physical activity, no catching. <clears throat> physical exam uh, is actually fairly good, just minimal symptoms, minimal effusion. What is the most uh, appropriate initial, oops, sorry, initial treatment? Um, especially given his age, I would just uh, go with one so that um, see if he can heal this on his own. Exactly. Yeah, and, and the key here is that, first of all, he's a kid, right? So sometimes they can remodel <clears throat> their bone and, and cartilage better. So even if the bone looks, you know, like it has, say, an OCD lesion, um, he might be able to heal it. And then the other key is by the time you see him, his physical exam is fairly normal and he does not have locking, okay? If he had locking or catching because, say, he had a loose cartilage piece floating around, then potentially you would be more aggressive to do surgery. So yeah, I would say number one. Okay. Um, how about Andrew? <laughs> All right. Which uh, biochemical that is associated with maintenance of the articular cartilage phenotype is most important during growth and development? Oh man, I do <laughs> not know the answer to this. Let's go with uh, Decorin. One. Okay. Oh three. man, it's three. No problem. Yeah, the answer is three. Yeah, Caitlin, um, when she was studying for boards, had actually sent me a few cart like random cartilage questions from her studying. Um, yeah. So, so the answer is this uh, parathyroid-related um, protein, and apparently it produces vasodilation and does have a role in maturing bone and cartilage and in um, end chondral bone formation. Okay, how about Heather? What is the predominant function of agrican in articular cartilage? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure agrican is related to um, water balance, but both three and five seem to get to that. Um, I guess I'm gonna go with three though. Yeah, this one is tricky because you're right. It does have to do with the water balance, but apparently the, the answer was five. So exert swelling pressure against the restraint of collagen. Um, so agrican is the major proteoglycan in articular cartilage. 
and it does have hydrophilic behavior. It helps provide the hydrating gel structure in conjunction with hyaluronin and link protein. Okay, so now, you know, I don't even know what time it is. Let me just double check here. Okay, we're still, okay. So I just have a couple of, of cases and then we can take questions. Um, so these are patients from my practice. This is a 46 year old male, has right knee pain, uh, never had a knee problem before, but started acutely four months ago after backpacking down thousands of feet along a waterfall. He was having sharp patellar area pain with hiking stairs, squatting, and um, active leg extension, also some catching, but better with rest. So on exam, he had pain with active extension at about 30 degrees. Um, he had an MRI and x-rays and uh, the MRI showed a 12 by eight millimeter delaminated uh, patellar chondromalacia area with bone edema. He had already tried physical therapy and had a cortisone injection with temporary relief. And I had actually talked to him about Visco, uh, but he didn't want, didn't want Visco. Okay, here's his imaging. So you can see, I mean, we're focusing on the kneecap joint, looks pretty normal. And then here's his MRI. So here's that irregular cartilage area with some bone edema. And here it is on the sagittal view. Okay, it's hard for me to see who else. Who else is on the go? All right, um, Sachin, what what would you what would you think about doing for this patient? Yeah, I mean, I think this is like one of those uh, challenging situations because it's obviously a patellar lesion. Um, the size of twelve by eight. I mean, it's small, but it's still in the patellofemoral joint. That can be really symptomatic. And he's already tried some non-operative things. Um, you know, I think like at this point. Uh, I think like obviously there's like cartilage-based procedures, and or if there's anything to offload it. Um, I don't think he has any. Um, reason to, you know, do any offloading procedure, like if he had, um, you know, patellar mal malalignment or something like that. So, I mean, I, I think here I would, I would personally try to like microfracture it, even though I know outcomes of microfracture in the patellofemoral joint aren't as great um, before, and then also get a Macy biopsy at that time. And then mm -hmm. if it doesn't improve, then I would uh, plan for Macy. Great. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I did are, are very similar. So, yeah, and so my thought process with him too um, is, I mean, even, even if say he looked a little bit malaligned or, or his TTTG was a little bit high, I mean, he never ever had symptoms before, right? So, so yeah, I, I, I don't think that you would need to, um, to realign him. <clears throat> so with him, um, yeah, I mean, I, I consented him for microfracture, but I ended up just doing a chondroplasty with, yeah. with the Macy biopsy, with the thought that, um, you know, if, if he didn't do well enough from me just cleaning up this area that I could go, go back in and do, um, and do a, a Macy. Now, um, after that rush, Brian Cole article, <laughs> you know, sh showing that maybe it's okay to microfracture and then do Macy later. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I think I'd be a little more aggressive to to microfracture this this lesion, especially in a young healthy person. Um, but back then, we still really did think that oh shoot, if you microfracture and then you want to do Macy later, it might not do as well. So this was from a few years ago. So I just did um, a chondroplasty. He did have a little loose chip of cartilage that I removed, and he did so well. I I actually never um, never had to do the Macy. Um, and he's actually sent me some of his, some of his friends. That's okay. Great. Oh, and, and th this is just a picture from the, from the Macy biopsy. And this is a, a similar case. And again, this is just driving home the point. Like you don't necessarily have to go to something aggressive right away. Just don't underestimate chondroplasty. So this is another patient of mine. She's 21 years old. Um, she's, she was an athletic training student. She was a softball catcher for many years. So I think just really wore out her patellofemoral joint. Um, so mild pain, but then for about a year had increased pain only over the, the, peri, the patellofemoral joint with mild swelling and crepitus. She had eight out of 10 pain with stairs, running and squatting. On exam, she had a positive patellar grind, good motion and a, a small effusion. Okay, and this is her imaging, looked good on x-ray, but see her patella just, a lot of the cartilage doesn't look doesn't look very good. 
So in a similar fashion, I just did a chondroplasty for her. This is what it looked like intraoperatively. And I took a Macy biopsy and I actually never needed to implant the biopsy and she's doing well. So just something to think about. But while you're in there, I recommend taking the, the Macy biopsy. Just to take the biopsy, I mean, it takes a little bit of time, but, but that's actually not very expensive. I looked it up at one point. I think it's something like $600 just to you know, have the kit to take the biopsy and store it. So you're, um, yeah, it's, it's just a good insurance policy with, with not a lot to lose to, to keep the biopsy. Um, Dr. Lara, quick question. Um, huh? For chondroplasty, do you find that it's more often successful, like in these types of cases in the patellofemoral joint? compare it because it's less of a weight bearing joint? Yeah, you know, that, that's, a good, um, that's a good question. I, I would say anec anecdotally, yes, um, because you're right with, with just weight bearing, it's, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not as load as load bearing, right? If we do Macy, for example, in the patellofemoral joint versus um, in the medial lateral compartments, we let those patients weight bear right away in extension. So, um, I have found that, but I, I'm not, I guess I didn't come across any studies with say searching for the CPT code 29877, which would, would be chondroplasty in different compartments and comparing outcomes. Um, I, I think that would, that's a really good idea say for a, for a, a database study. Um, did any, did any of you in your reading come across anything with say just purely chondroplasty outcomes in different compartments? I mean, I'm sure it would be hard to like control for the severity of the, you know, chondral lesion, but it seems to be interesting. Right, right. And even in the patellofemoral joint, I mean, I have had these patients that have done well, but I, I hardly ever would just jump to it, right? I mean, in all these patients, they've tried therapy, they've usually had at least at least one injection, and they're, and they're young, right? Like th this patient who is the softball player, I mean, she's in her twenties. Um, so, so yeah, it's still, it's still a last resort. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think if their alignment isn't, you know, isn't too bad that, um, that, that it is, it is a good thing to do. And you can just take the Macy biopsy at, at the same time. But yeah, I do, I do, I do think if the lesion is more in the, um, medial or lateral compartments that I, I probably would be more prone to say, do a microfracture or an oats or something to try to, to get cartilage to fill that area, um, just because it will be more, um, you know, more load bearing throughout the years. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, no, no problem. Whoops. Oh, I dropped my phone. Um, I was just checking what time it was. In, in interest of time, um, because I, I think Dr. Wingfield's starting, right? In, in about five minutes? Uh, yeah, on a, different, on a separate link. Oh, sure, okay. Do you wanna just um, do questions? Do, do people have, have questions? Or I also have one more case I can, I can go through and talk about. When you have cartilage lesions that you think are you're just gonna, you know, smaller cartilage lesions, you're obviously not getting like alignment, or I don't think you're getting alignment films routinely. Is there like a certain threshold where you like, oh, you know, this is a larger lesion, and now you start planning for possible like oats or whatever mesoplasty? Then do you always get alignment films? Yeah, no, that that's um, that's a good question. Kind of similar to what what we were talking about, right? With Ben Moth, the end of his talk yeah. with 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 ACLs. So, um, yeah, I, I would say for for primary procedures, okay. So so if the patient has um, has never had a, a cartilage procedure before, and 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 you just say look at them, um, and they don't look like they're an excessive um, varus or valgus or you know, lateral patellar tracking, then, then usually I do not get alignment films. Um, I mean, you, you can tell a little bit sometimes on the, the AP or the, or the Rosenberg also, um, or, or say on the, on the merchant view, um, but particularly if it's a revision or if it's a, a, larger, a larger lesion, like 
at, at least two centimeters, then I would say I, I do lean towards getting, getting alignment films. Thank you. Sure, uh, other questions? Okay, um, let's see, do we have a few more minutes? I can just go through this, this case. Let's do it. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just talk through this one. Um, okay, so, so this is a, a 20 year old female basketball player for the Academy of Art University. She acutely injured her right knee in October 2018 while landing a jump. She had immediate lateral knee pain and swelling, some catching, um, lateral joint line pain and effusion on exam. So her um, x-rays were negative, showed neutral alignment and MRI was obtained and it showed a lateral femoral condyle OCD lesion and the largest in the largest dimension, it was nine millimeters. Didn't play for two months, uh, just did low impact activities, then had a new MRI in December, 2018, which showed some resolution of the bone edema, then played the last month of the season. The season's now over, um, still has moderate pain, swelling and occasional catching. And now she's asking, you know, what, what, what should I do? Um, so this was the first MRI. You can see that there's a lot of bone edema. Here's the cartilage lesion right here. So again, this is the first MRI with a lot of bone edema. And then this is the, um, the MRI three months later with less bone edema, but she still has this cartilagian, cartilage lesion and still has a lot of lateral symptoms. And I measured it on multiple views. And so it's about nine millimeters in the largest dimension, but she definitely wants to return to competitive basketball, um, like a high, high impact sport long-term. So in interest of time, I'll just talk through this, but in this patient, um, particular, particularly because she wants to play competitive basketball, um, I'm, uh, I, I recommended an, an oats for her. And I thought the lesion was small enough um, to where she'd be a good candidate for um, all autographed oats. Now, one other thing to think about when, whenever you're say booking somebody for an oats and you wanna try to use their own tissue, is you also always wanna look at the MRI cuts in the patellofemoral joint, okay? Because we actually had a, a Feely case presented at one of our indications conferences recently, and we looked at the image and we all thought, oh great, yeah, let's just do oats and we'll do autographed. But then if you look through the patellofemoral joint, um, it was also a basketball player and he had just had a lot of wear in his say lateral trochlea. Well, then you're not necessarily gonna have a good, healthy um, autographed donor site to, to take from. So just something else to think about. 